you know, from the spinal cord into other parts of the nervous system. Like so there are other tracks that go into the cerebellum, like the inferior cerebellar peduncle, you know, carries information, you know, from the spinal cord, you know, to the cerebellum through, uh, through the uh, medulla oblongata, that is inferior cerebellar peduncle. So we have this spinal meniscus inferior olivary uh, inferior olivary nucleus and then we have the trigeminal tract we have the vestibular cerebellar tract all these are located you know along the lateral side of the cerebellum so now as i told you before in the medulla oblongata we also have certain important you know centers and these centers are nothing but the nuclei of certain cranial nerves that you all know like this vagus nerve you know it the tenth cranial nerve. It has about three important nuclei that, you know, the axons of this, you know, nuclei combine together to form the vagus nerve. Similarly, we also have the ninth cranial nerve, that is the glossopharyngeal nerve. That one also originates from the nuclei that are located within the medulla oblongata. So all this, you know, nuclei of these two important cranial nerve, that is the glossopharyngeal nerve, the ninth, and then the um, the tenth, that is the vagus nerve. This nuclei, you know, where these two important nerves, nerves originate, they are the ones that give rise to these centers that I'm talking about. You know, we have this breathing center, we have the heart rate center, we have the blood pressure center, vomiting center, and swallowing center. You all know that you know the the, the, the vagus nerve supplies the pharynx. You know, so the glossopharyngeal nerve also supplies the pharynx either sensory or motor because the vagus nerve supplies you know a sensory part you know and also it has motor part component similarly the same thing with the uh, glossopharyngeal nerve it has a motor component it has a sensory component so part of the functions of this you know is to allow for swallowing the the, the glossopharyngeal nerve and the vagus nerve you know for the breathing and you know the uh, heart rate regulation because if you can remember the vagus nerve and the nerve they supply the cardiovascular system if you remember if you remember your thoracic thorax anatomy very well you know the cardiac plexus you know is made up of this uh you know the vagus nerve and you know the barrel receptor supplied by the glossopharyngeal nerve and so on and so forth so it's like the other ones that regulate you know this heart rate and the blood pressure and even the breathing, you know. So now, what are the causes of lesion, you know, of the medulla oblongata? In the medulla oblongata, actually, since if you now take each half of the medulla oblongata, medial half and lateral half of the half of the medulla, that means if you divide the medulla oblongata into two, right half and the left half. So even in each of this half, now you divide the half into two parts medial part a lateral part so each of these parts of each of this half can have a syndrome what we call medial medullary syndrome or lateral medullary syndrome that means medial medullary syndrome affecting the medial part of the medulla oblongata lateral medullary syndrome affecting the lateral part of the medulla Oblongata. That means wherever it occurs, it affects those structures that are located in there. So, for example, if we have the medial part of the medulla oblongata being affected or damaged by either the artery that is supplying that side, mostly the anterior spinal artery supplying that side, if it is blocked, these medial structures are going to be affected. Because we know that the motor pathway is affected since it is on the medial side, Part of the features of somebody with this medial medullary uh, injury or syndrome, that's what we call hemiparesis. That means weaknesses of both the upper and the lower limb on the contralateral side of the legion. That means if the medial part of the medulla oblongata of the right hand side is affected, that means there's a contralateral hemiparesis of the left upper limb and the left lower limb. So these limbs are going to be weak. If you want to raise the upper uh, lower limb, you may not likely be able to do that if you are lying down. 
Similarly, if you want to raise your upper limb on that left side, you are not likely going to raise it up well because they are going to be weak. At times, they may even get hemiplegic, so half of the body may be paralyzed completely, not even weakness. So there may be a paralysis. That means both the upper and the lower limb at the opposite side of the legion is going to be paralyzed. That is what we call hemiplegia. So you may have hemiparesis of the limb or hemiplegia of that limb. That is as a result of the motor pathway. The corticospinal fibers are affected at the middle side of the medulla oblongata. Similarly, because of the involvement of the medial lamniscus, because it's also located on the medial side of the medulla oblongata, you know, so there is lots of this vibration and proprioception sense from the opposite side. Because if you can remember your anatomy very well, the sensation of vibration and proprioception sense, if it is taken from the right side of the body, the information has been taken upward. As soon as this information reaches the medulla oblongata, what you call the gracile nucleus at the level of the open part of the medulla oblongata. You know, from there now, second order neuron ascends up within that nucleus and then it crosses toward the opposite side. You get it? So if there is a lesion, you know, above that level, that means there is a contralateral loss of vibration sense, you know, because from this side it now crosses over to the left side, from the right, crosses to the right. So if it is the right that's affected, definitely this side is going to be affected because it crosses over. So there's a contralateral, you know, loss of this vibration sense and proprioception sense. The same thing with this uh, motor part, if you can remember, remember your corticospinal fibers, as they descend down, once they come around the medulla oblongata, the lower part, there's a crisscrossing. One from the right crosses down to the left, and one from the left crosses down to the right. That is why when you have a left side involvement, the right side is going to show the features. The same thing with this uh, middle lamniscus. Similarly, the motor nucleus of the hypoglossal nerve. The motor nucleus of the hypoglossal nerve, since there is no crossing of this hypoglossal nerve, you know, the right goes to the right, the left goes to the left. That is why we have ipsilateral paralysis of the muscle of the tongue. You get it? So if you ask the person to bring out his tongue, the tongue deviates toward the side of the lesion because the muscles at that side of the lesion are paralyzed. So the normal muscles that are functioning, because they are strong, if you ask the person to bring the tongue out like this, the stronger muscles will now push the weaker muscles towards that side of the lesion. So if the tongue is debated to the left, that means it is the left part of the medulla oblongata that is affected. Are you clear? Good. So we can also have lack of eye adduction. So if you ask the person to look at his nose, you get it, to, 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 to look at his nose, to, to, to allow this right eye to look at this nose like this. So the eye is not going to do that. That is what you call adduction of the eye. If you ask the person to look towards his side, that is lateral movement of the eye. That is abduction of the eye. So because you know eye movement is divided into adduction movement of the eye towards the nose and abduction movement of the eye towards the lateral side. And then you do upward movement and downward movement. And then you do some rotational movement of the eye. So now you are likely going to have this lack of eye adduction because of this involvement of the you know, medial longitudinal fasciculus that I've discussed because it's responsible for this you know, regulation of our eye movement. So these are some of the features of passing with this medial, you know, medial medullary syndrome. So we call it medial medullary syndrome and this is as a result of you know lesion or occlusion or infection of the anterior spinal artery that supplies you know the medial part of the medulla oblongata so all these medial structures in the medulla oblongata are going to be affected and the features are this so let me just break and the next i will discuss the lateral medullary syndrome